We'll go on to the, uh, to the bulletin. It's nice when, uh, when Jesus shows up. Um, and we always believe that Jesus shows up, but it's nice when he shows up in the authority that says, I'm here to heal some people and have them and help them to believe. And for us all just to stand in faith and praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those of you that surrendered and, and just trust in God. And, and I, just, I just praise you, Father. You know... This is BGMC Sunday. That's BGMC Bob. And this is BGMC Sunday. So, can we have somebody take this down the middle aisle? And anybody that's got a BGMC option, go ahead and just put that in there. It's also missions Sunday. If you have a missions pledge, you want to turn that in, you have it. The New Hope Church is having a free women's event on Saturday, October 8th, 9 to 3. There's a notice out there on the bulletin board. I have that out there. Um, if you want to find out more of the particulars, uh, Jackie Collier called in that her grandson had to go to the hospital, actually they ended up in Ann Arbor. He had a, uh, an impacted wisdom tooth, I believe she said, so they had to take him to the hospital. So he's doing okay. Uh, she just couldn't be here today because she's been up dealing with that uh, for most of the, the day and night. Uh, Brother Green Schellenbarger uh, has went home to be with Jesus. Uh, they're going to have a, a, a service for him, a memorial service, uh, Saturday, October 8th at 1 p.m. at the Wilbur United Methodist Church. Um, I understand the address is 3278 Sherman Road in East Tawas is the address. And uh, I believe there's a, a light fair of uh, some cake and some coffee or something after that. So anyway, uh, I'd like to have you attend and, and, uh, and be the brother... Uh, Brother Eric is going to be doing the service because he knew Gary uh, much more than I ever knew him, and, and he can share from, from his life. So uh, he's going to be doing the, the service, and uh, I just wanted to announce that. And anyone in the church family here, um, and I've had several people have approached me that wants to be a uh, member, you've never joined the church officially, um, we're still going to love you if you do or you don't, but... Uh, God builds his church through unity and commitment and faith. And if you want to be a member of the church, let me know. We're going to have a class here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't take uh, a lot of time to, to do this, to become a member of the church, but uh, we like to make it official. And then allows you to have input on uh, voting on situations. So we would like to have that. So if there is nothing else that we need to share this morning, does anybody have anything they need to share? Okay. Um, Brother Bob's class, I think, is winding down. We've had a, a, a good uh, three sessions now, Bob. I think he's had two more. He thinks maybe a little bit more, but uh, uh, still, not, uh, still not too late to come and see what's going on in the class on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a good class. It's been a good good group to share so uh, that's still going on uh, on Wednesday night so please uh, come and be part of that um, in our in our Sunday morning service today I hope to be able to share with you a, 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 I'm going to call it a spiritual supporting structure or I'm going to call it the framework um, needed to properly develop this spirit-empowered life that we've been talking about for three weeks now to its fullest potential. What we will study this morning in our quest for developing that spirit-empowered life will require me to compare God's spiritual power to the kind of physical or earthly power that we're kind of familiar with. In the first parts of this series, we have seen that more fasted life is essential, part one. We have seen that we needed to get rid of earthly bondages in part two. 
We have seen that in part three that we must have on the full armor of God. That was part three. These first three parts of the series are essential for each of us that wants to have the spirit-empowered life. And what we're going to study today will complete this, this set. And I spoke of my need to compare God's power with a form of earthly power that we all can understand in this fourth part today. And I want to use electricity. Not that it compares in any way to God's power, but because electricity <laughs> is very powerful. And I worked for 15 years for Consumers Energy in the power business. I understand what it takes to produce the kind of power that we are accustomed to at our homes, our, our, our family vacation spots, our churches, our, our, our schools, the lights outside that stay lit at night. We can see and we can enjoy the benefits of electricity each and every day of our life. We can very accustomed to it. It seems to sometimes there's an endless supply. You walk over to a switch and you flip it. Well, that's because there are great big turbines, there are pumps, there are all kinds of mechanisms and boilers in place. Down to a little place called the Carnivore Complex in Essexville, there are six huge generators that produce much of the electricity that we use on this side of the state. Besides that, there are plants in Monroe, Holland, and Mesquite, Mesquite, Lennington Pump and Storage, and there are some nuclear plants that are in various forms actually of shutting down, but they have powered Michigan's power for a long time. And all of these plants, with their huge supporting system, produce and produce an enormous amount of electricity that makes our lives warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, and lights our, our homes and our cities. God's power is much the same way, though it is so much greater and does so much more. We can enjoy the benefits of the spirit and power of life because of God's power. But what we must also understand is that there is a supporting system, that is a spiritual nature supporting system that enables the spirit-empowered life and the spirit-empowered work to take place but we need to keep that spiritual support system strong and in place. If you operate a nuclear plant and all of its supporting systems the right way, you'll produce a vast amount of electricity. And in fact, you can encounter some big problems if you don't remember Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. That's what happens when you don't pay attention to these power plants. If we if we do not operate with God's precepts, if we don't follow his teachings, though we may be living the spirit-empowered life, there will come a place where that power will not be available to us because we haven't been keeping up the support structure. And just like the electrical business, it is also the same in God's power business. It usually is the supporting system that fails and causes the outage. It's not always the plants that go down. In winter, when ice gets heavy, and we know where we live in Lenny, and the tree limbs fall over, and the power lines come down, it's not because of the problems in Essex, it's because of the problems just down the road from us. And then it takes the power company a lot to get the trucks out and the guys out and to climb up and do all they need to do to get power flowing again. In the spiritual winters of our life, when things get heavy, too heavy for us to carry sometimes, what we do not pay attention to can become like a falling tree limb. Land on one of the supporting structures that brings the power into our life. In both cases, it can be the support system that fails. God's power never fails. God's power is always there. But many times we fail to keep everything in place to allow God's power to flow into our life. At these times, what happens is God's people may fail to properly maintain their spiritual support system. And the last thing we want to do is interrupt God's blessings in our lives. Amen? Amen. This morning, I would like to share with you what is needed in our life, the life of a believer, or in the life of a person that wants to be a believer, before they can truly experience the spirit-empowered life to its fullest. If you would this morning... I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. Seems to me we do a lot of exercising in this church, but evidently God wants us to do that.
Stand and lift your arms and your hands towards heaven and say this after me. Heavenly Father, I want to be plugged in. Plugged into your power system. I want to know what I will need to do to ensure an uninterrupted spirit-empowered life. Heavenly Father, this morning, I have come with an open mind. I'm ready to receive. My heart is open to your word and your will for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Please have a seat. Praise the Lord. If you would turn to Matthew 4, look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Holy Spirit of God, we ask you to come now as the teacher to do just that. Open our hearts, open our minds to the endless possibilities of receiving God's power into our life and receiving God's word and to help us overcome whatever we may face. Come, Holy Spirit, help each one of us today live a life of victory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Matthew 4, 1 through verse 11 says this. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up to the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, Lest at a time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up to an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Sometimes I will read from the King James Version, sometimes from the NIV. This particular one seemed to be truer to what I wanted to accomplish, so that's why I'm in the King James Version. I do not believe that God speaks in the King James Version, but sometimes the wording is appropriate for what I am using. In our human lifetime, we as followers of Jesus Christ will, just like him, be tempted many times with the devil's schemes. Here in this text from the book of Matthew, we can see that Jesus is facing one temptation after another. And these temptations are very strong and most alluring. First, the devil tempts the Son of God, but as it says in verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Changing stones into bread was certainly not a problem and an impossibility for Jesus. After all, it was him who created the entire universe and everything in it. The devil wanted Jesus to create a miracle for his benefit, for Satan's amusement. And so at the same time, to somehow trick the Son of God into serving the devil's decrees, his schemes, before serving God. But Jesus would have no part of entertaining Satan. He states in verse 4, it's written, And shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here the bread represents human need, human sinfulness. And Jesus rebukes Satan's temptation and says that man needs to live a life guided by God's every word and not just man's selfish desires. Second, we see in verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. 
And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee in their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Here in the second temptation, we find that it is God's temple in Jerusalem. Think of this, the very emblem of God's presence on earth that Satan has brought the Son of God to in the hope of tricking him into performing a miracle at this sacred and holy place. Why the temple? Because if Jesus would have followed the devil's commands, he would have been forsaking God's will at the very embodiment of his earthly dwelling place. But Jesus said very quickly in verse 7, he said unto him, It is written, again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus was displaying spiritual power, a spiritual position that all believers need to be able to take. And that is that we believe as believers in God's word and are not allowing ourselves to be tempted by anything evil to prove God's power. Don't ever let the devil cause you to try to prove something. We do not have to try to tempt God to perform a miracle. We just have to live by faith and say that when we are in need, that we know that God will be there to help us. Finally, in the third temptation, we can see Satan at work in verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Well, here it is. The devil is the prince of this, of this world, the prince of the spiritual world, and all of man lives under his authority in a world that is guided by what? Lust and greed. Here the devil puts out all the stops, tried to get the Son of God to turn from following God himself, to submit to Satan's authority with a temptation of having what? Authority over all the kingdoms of the world. What human man would be able to turn that down? It was, by human standards, a very tantalizing temptation. But Jesus quickly and finally ends the devil's offers and presence by saying in verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And look what happens to Satan, verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. That was it. Satan had no more. He was done. Jesus used scripture. He used God's word. Satan had no argument for that. Here Jesus proved that God's power is greater by simply quoting scripture. Always remember, when you think you're under a satanic attack, use the word of God to end that battle. Amen. Through using the word of God all by itself, Satan and his evil plans are foiled, and Satan himself is ordered to lead. He has to obey the word of God when somebody is wielding it in authority. The ministering angels that came and visited the Lord after the temptation represent the fact that after spiritual battles with evil, a believer that operates in righteousness can and will receive messengers from heaven that will spiritually minister to them. God's there for you. In our search for the answers to how to live the spirit of power in life, we can use this biblical account of the Lord's life to help us secure the same kind of human life that he enjoyed. We can live with the same assurance that we can overcome whatever we face in life by using God's authority in our life too. How about you? Have you ever noticed that when problems come in your life, that sometimes it seems that they all come at once? I was talking to Mark this morning. He says he's got some things going on in his life. Seems like they're all coming at once. Did you ever have that? Anybody ever had that? Yeah. I mean, this bus, that break. This is this is not working. Something's going on. You're not feeling good. Something's wrong with the kids. You name it. Well, when that happens, you could be, many times you are, under satanic attack. And just like we see in this story, 
time and time again. The devil will come at you with more and more and more. Here, it's more lies, more temptations, more problems, trying to destroy Jesus' life, and him trying to destroy your life and your faith in the same way. So how can we find the answer to how Jesus overcame these problems as his followers? How can we do that? And also, how can we overcome our own temptations in our own life and our problems and in so doing, find the supporting structure that will help us live the spirit and power of life. That's what we're looking for. Let's see what we can find. Look at Matthew 3, verse 13. Matthew 3, verse 13. This happened just before Jesus was tempted. Matthew 3, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 says this. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to the Jordan unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. These events took place in the chapter just before Jesus went through all of these temptations to overcome the devil. So what took place was the building of the supporting spiritual structure that was about to enable Jesus to live the miraculous spirit-empowered life that we find recorded. Jesus was born into and in every way lived a human life. And just like us, he lived the life experience, he had trials, he had joys. And like all faithful believers, he enjoyed a close relationship with God. But there came this watershed moment in Scripture when he decides to step beyond mere Christianity and in so doing leaves us footprints to follow to the Spirit-empowered life. His life was all about teaching. It was all about leading. He said, come follow me. Friends, it was here at this place that Jesus begins to experience and to live the Spirit-empowered life, a miraculous life that every believer, guess what, is called to experience. We're called to experience the same kind of life. It was the Jordan River. It was at that place. The last part of the supporting structure was put into place. And now within this man, this man Jesus, who walked in the human flesh and who resided in the power and kingdom of God and all of his potential and all of his promises was wrapped up in him. And from this day on, Jesus would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan's evil plans and he would defeat him at every turn. Imagine no more sickness. Jesus healed it. No more blindness or even death. Jesus healed that. Could stop the spirit-empowered servant of the Most High. And it was here we see Jesus was calling all believers to come and follow him. Friends, we are called, my friends, we are called, my friends, to follow our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to experience what he experienced, to live what he lived, to have the same power that he wielded, and to minister in the same way. Why are churches dying? Why are churches closing up? Why do you see churches that become an antique shop? Because they fail to wield the power that God wants them to wield. So what does all this teach us? What does it mean? Look in your Bibles to the last piece of the scripture this morning. Well, there will be a couple more. Turn to 1 John 5, 1 through 8, if you would. 1 John 1, 5 through 8. Anytime a pastor says it's the last scripture, it's never the last scripture. Because you know, as you're doing your study, you always find oh man, that's a good study is that. 1 John 5, 1 through verse 5. says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Read that again. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? God has called us to be followers, to be believers. And in so doing, he has left us an example of what we need to do and to know so as to experience the Spirit-empowered life. First of all, a person needs to believe that Jesus is born of God. And in so doing, begin a love relationship with God who loves each one of us. Second, we need to then come to understand that we are called to overcome this world the way he overcame the world. The world ain't supposed to beat us up. We're supposed to take control of the situation. God's people are not to be seen as victims. We are to be seen as winners, victorious. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Say that. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. We need to believe that. God's people are not to be victims. We are to be winners. Everyone say this. God makes me a winner. Say again. God makes me a winner. One more time so the devil hears us. God makes me a winner! Boy, you just scared Satan. There's a bunch of little demons just went running out of here. Boy, we're going to tell Satan what they're going on, what they're doing at that church. They all think they're winners. The next step in the process that will lead us to the spirit and power of life is to understand and complete the supporting spiritual structure to carry the power that we're believing a lifetime. And that means putting certain things in our physical and spiritual life in order, so to speak. In the next few verses, we will see what needs to be applied to our life so as to complete that supporting structure that will carry God's power forth from here until our last moment of life. See, here's that other piece of scripture I told you about. 1 John 5, 6, you're not too far though. 1 John 5, 6, 7, 8 says this. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and blood. And these three agree in one. Verse 6 speaks about the ministry of Jesus Christ. He came by water, which was water baptism, in the water by the blood, and which is the blood that he shed on the cross for our sins. Talk about being washed. Jesus didn't come by water only. He came by the shedding of his blood. You see, it wasn't a half measure by God. God demanded that his son shed blood to set us free. Not just the water baptism, but the shedding of blood to set us free. We are to receive that water. We are to receive that blood. The water through Jesus came was that which allowed him to experience the Spirit's witness upon his life. He came up out of the Jordan, which allowed Jesus to come bearing the truth of God, which all alone would defeat the devil at every encounter. Verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Trinity in heaven is pictured here as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are all one, which all make up the Trinity of God. That's where the power comes from, my friends. To be a believer, one must believe in the Trinity as pictured here. But to be a believer that lives the Spirit-empowered life, one needs to accept and then follow in the footsteps of Jesus as recorded in 1 John 5.8. 1 John 5.8 says this, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Amen. 
We're not alone in this life. On earth, we're not alone in this life if we walk with and trust in God because there are three that bear witness in the earth, just like there are three that bear witness in heaven. But the difference is that the three that bear witness in the earth are displayed through the life choice of believers like you and me and how we choose to experience this Christian life. We can't leave a part out because it may seem like we don't want to deal with it because we don't have enough time for it. Just as Jesus had to complete his supporting spiritual structure to support and live that spirit and power life, he displayed in the gospel, we also must now choose to do the same. It's a challenge, it's a calling. That means we must have three elements in our life before the spirit and power life will completely become a reality. After salvation, we must desire to be filled with the spirit of God. Verse 8. Next, the most important is that you must develop in yourself a deep love and a desire for the blood of Christ to fill and to wash over your life. Third, said there are three witnesses in the earth to what God sees in our heart. And if they are in their proper place, then you will have complete supporting structure because the operation within the believer of what is calling the spirit and power of life. We have to receive all of these. We can't leave any of them out. The spirit and power of life, which means that you are now ready and able and desirous to face the devil and defeat him without fear. How would you like to scare the devil? Come on, show up, devil. I will kick you in the can. Which means that you're ready to face him. I say that the blood is essential because too many churches today have forsaken the teaching about the blood. And I will tell you that without the blood, the church of Jesus Christ in many places of the world is dead and it's powerless. You drive down the road and you see an antique shop that used to be a church, that's a church that forsook the blood. You see one that's turned into a bar, that's a church that forsook the blood. You see somebody living in a church, that's a church. The first of the black. They thought it wasn't important anymore. Listen to what the Bible says about our need for the blood. Look at Leviticus 17.11. See, there's another scripture I threw in when I told you I wasn't going to do that anymore. Leviticus 17.11. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. That's pretty easy to find. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for your soul. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11. The life of our flesh is in the blood. We know that. And God says, I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Upon the altar was a cross. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Church, just as the blood that flows through our human veins is our life, so it is the same with the church. I say that because the blood shed upon the cross at Calvary, the altar of Christ, is the life that brings God's power to the church. We must have that blood flowing in us, through us, in our words, in our songs, in our praise, in everything we do. Jesus came into his ministry by the Spirit, by the water, and by the blood. We are to follow him and to experience the Spirit-empowered life as he did. We must be willing to do the same in our life. Now I pray that you will all commit to completing your own spiritual supporting structure to this point in this series, which will then allow you to experience the full Spirit's power at work in and through you. I ask you this this morning. Do you seek the Spirit's presence in your life? If you do, say amen. amen. Have you been or do you need to be baptized in water? Have you been thinking about this? If you have been thinking about this, if you have been, if you have not been, I want you to get this done in your life. It's important. It will help you realize God's fullness going on in your life and the Spirit's fullness. And finally, how do you feel about the subject of the blood of Jesus Christ? 
It needs to become to you like honey so sweet, a taste that you long for. Because without the blood in your life, you are lacking power. Don't be ashamed of the blood. Reach for it. Desire it. Because it was given to you by a God that loves you incredibly. How many of you could give your son to save a stranger? To say, there you go, God. We nail him to a cross and take his blood. It took a lot. It took a lot for God to be able to do that. That's how much he loves us. As we close today, at this halfway point in the seven-part series, I'm going to say today, and you can only know this in your heart and your mind, if you have been thinking about or making a decision about the fullness of God operating in your life, and you wonder if maybe I'd, I'd lost something out of my life, my challenge to you today is, many of us have had hands laid on us, many of us have been prayed for, many of us have been saved. Brother Bob's teaching a class on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we get by that baptism of the Lord. If you haven't been baptized, I really pray you consider it and you make a choice to follow it. Because when you follow Jesus as he came up out of that water, represents the death, the burial, and the resurrection. God showed him the full power of heaven upon his life because he said, I commit myself the way Jesus committed himself. Make that decision, and I hope you make it. So I want to get water baptized. I don't care if you're 60 years in Christ. Don't leave home without it. Don't walk away with it and thinking it's something that's too late for me. I want to assure you that the Spirit, the water, and the blood are waiting to be applied to your life and every prayer and your faith in every way possible. Do you need to complete the supporting structure to allow the fullness of the Spirit and power of life to fill you through and through? Are you here today and you don't know Jesus? Are you here today and maybe you never knew about God's Spirit or God's power in your life? And when we all close our eyes and we pray in just a moment, I'm going to ask you this. While we're praying and believing for God to speak to our life about the spirit and power of life, I'm going to ask you that have never invited Christ in your life to speak to God and say, Lord, I need you in my life. I want to live the spirit and power of life. I haven't even taken the first step. You can, right now, right here, today, become a child of the living God. With an assurance that at the end of this life, guess what? You're going to walk those streets of gold. You're going to see Jesus face to face. And you will live for eternity. But if you accept him right now, your life can certainly turn around. And the fullness and the measure of all God's promises can take hold today. There's so much more than waiting for the end of your life. You can start receiving blessing upon blessing today by inviting Christ to be the Lord and be alive. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's do that right now. I'm going to ask you right now, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you just to say within your heart, Dear Jesus, I've been a sinner. I've messed my life up. I've been doing everything else that I wanted to do. I haven't taken the time to find you. But dear Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life right now. To let me know that power and that authority. Lord, that blood from Calvary's cross, wash me with it. Fill me with your spirit. Help me, Lord, to be the Christian you called me to be. And for all the rest of us that are here today, Lord God, speak to every one of us. Help each one of us, especially those that maybe have never been baptized, to say, yes, Lord, yes. I want the fullness of Jesus Christ and all of the blessings of heaven to reign upon my life and to help me become the person, God, you want me to be. Right now, Let's each and every one of us as we leave this place. And let us leave with the assurance that we don't go alone. You leave with us. And you will be there watching over us, caring for us, loving us each and every moment of our life. I give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great Sunday afternoon.